Hi and welcome. We're so excited that you chose to join us today. And we hope that this message will inspire you to live the life that God designed you to live. For this message or others like it, you can go to our website or you can find us on our YouTube channel. Now sit back, relax, enjoy this message. Well, you know, there's something amazing that happens when you, out of your own mouth, start talking about the goodness of God. If you're looking for change today, improvement in your life, that's the way it comes. You know, all through the Bible, uh, uh, the oldest book in the Bible was Job, and Job was the richest man in the East, and he lost everything. Thought he was going to die, but at his lowest point, why he made this statement, I don't know about all this stuff, but my Redeemer lives. Yeah, in just a short time, God gave him double. <laughs> he had twice as much. The whole ordeal just lasted nine months, but it changed the day he said, my Redeemer lives. You know, King David, at his lowest point, his best friends were going to stone him to death. He got away. He encouraged himself in the Lord. He started talking about how good God was. A couple days later, he was rich, and all his people loved him again. J Jonah, he was in the fish for three days, the belly of the whale, surely going to die. And then he, but he said, hey, there's God. <laughs> he was up on dry ground, just like that. L led the greatest revival in history. The nation of Judah facing certain destruction. They got together and said, but for the Lord, he is good and his mercy endures forever. They said it over and over again. Three days later, they were the richest nation and most powerful nation in the world. They lived in peace as long as those people stayed alive. Apostle Paul and Silas facing death. They got together and sang about how good God was. Church of Philippi was born, the church that supported Paul all through his ministry. The city begged for his forgiveness for, for trying to kill him. In the book of Revelations, right at the end, it says that they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of God in their testimony, Amen. talking about how good God was. Amen. And right now today, uh, you know, there might be some people here that are facing tremendous challenges. And there might be some people that's just looking for a promotion. It doesn't matter. It's all the same to God. But I'm going to declare this over your life, and I hope you'll just agree with me that as far as you're concerned, the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. God wants to promote you. He wants to give you above all you could ask, think, or imagine in life today. The Lord is good. Turn away from the problem Focus on the fact that your Redeemer lives. The Lord is good, and things will change. I just declare that over everybody here today that will agree with me. Amen. Praise God. We're going to go on with the service. Uh, th thank you so much for coming to church today, though. Man, this service wouldn't be near as good if you weren't here. Uh, I'm Dave. I'm part of the staff here, and, and I'm, I'm so glad you're here. We we're just getting started. We're going to have some great things today. Why don't we greet each other, and we'll move on. So good to see you. Good to see you. So good to see I you. Testimony someday. Okay. <laughs> so good to see you guys. What a great service. We can go home right now. I could dismiss. We could all go home. Well, God's good, amen. What a great looking bunch of people here. Wow. It's good to see you all. Praise God. Well, we're going to have some fellowship afterwards so you can catch up then too. Amen. Praise God. I want to receive our offering, tithes and offerings. We had an inspiring message last week about tithing. So I want to receive our tithes and offerings. If the ushers can please help me. If you're giving cash, you would like a receipt. Um, for your giving, just slip your hand up. One of these ushers would give you, love to give you an offering envelope. If you're making out a check, you can make it out to Destiny Church. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements um, as you're getting your offering ready. 
Uh, ladies, uh, there's a, a Bible study at Char Slack's house um, every, um, every Wednesday, every other Wednesday, thank you. I don't know why I'm doing these announcements. It's by Chip, Chip Ingram, they're going through the Invisible War. And then also, um, there's roller skating. For all the you, you that are, are very steady on your feet and like to become even more steadier, or less steadier, there's, <clears throat> I'm sure there's some kids that if you'll stand there with skates on, wheels on, they'll push you around the room. But that's February 15th, Saturday, from three to nine. The admission's free, ages 12 and under must be accompanied by an adult. Skates are available to use. Dinner and concessions will also be available. So that's, um, those are a couple of the announcements. Let's pray over our offering. Lord, thank you that we can give. We're just so do it so cheerfully, Lord, because you love a cheerful giver. Pray that you'll bless the gift that we give today. Multiply it. And we just thank you, God, for all you've done for us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go ahead, men, pass the offering buckets. Josh here has an announcement about the men's meeting. Why don't you come up, Josh? All right. So this morning we're going to do a little exercise here. So before I tell you what we're going to do, I want all the men to stand up in here. Every man standing up. I got the mic so I can be patient. Every man standing up. All right. For some of you, that was no problem to stand up. It didn't bother you at all. For others of you, that took you out of your comfort zone. You didn't know what I was going to have you do next. We as men, we need to be able and willing to get out of our comfort zones. In church here, it's a safe place. Um, but God has called us to higher things. He wants us to go out of our comfort zone so we can reach the potential that he put on our life. He wants us to go out of our comfort zone so we can reach that destiny that when Jesus was dying on the cross, he had that plan for our lives. But if we stay in our comfort zone, we won't make that. We won't live the life that God wanted us to live. So for the men here, in three weeks, we're going to be having a gathering here at church. It's Saturday morning. And it's called Men Unite. And we want all the men to come here. It's going to take some of you out of your comfort zones. Some of you are going to rather be staying at home with the family, going fishing, working on projects, because you're safe there. But that's not what we need to do. We can't just stay in our comfort zone. God has called us to rise up to greater things. So right now, I just want you to think of one thing in your mind that you need boldness for, because that's what this theme is going to be about. It's about boldness for that Saturday morning. So think of one thing in your mind right now. What do you need boldness for? Something you've been putting off or afraid to do. Maybe it's in your parenting. Maybe it's in your relationship in your marriage. Maybe it's overcoming a stronghold. Or maybe it's a fear, a fear of failure. But you got that one thing in your mind that's going to take you to come out of your comfort zone? That's what we're looking at, working on. Our church, our community, and your family are depending on us to come out of our comfort zones, to live the life that God wants us to live. So I'm asking each and every one of you to put this on your calendar. It's February 29th from 8.30 to 10, and we want everyone to come. Ladies of the men that are standing here, make sure that calendar is clear, okay? We don't need any excuses why the man can't come. There's going to be some men here that may be single with children. If you see a man standing here that you know that's their situation, offer to uh, watch your kids for him. Okay? We have 52 guys here this morning, right in this church, right in this building, this room right here. So we're going to be planning for at least 52. There's ushers in the back, some guys that didn't make it. We're going to be planning for at least that many guys, expecting that you can come, okay? If you make it a priority, we as men know that we can get there. If it's our priority, we're going to get there. If it's not, it's going to get pushed off to the side, but we want this as a priority. But boldness is what we're going to be hitting on. So thank you. Hey Josh, is the Monday night still going? Well, God's good. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open them with me, please, 
to Mark chapter 11. I want to talk to you this morning. I titled this message, First Love, and then uh, also the buck stops here. First Love, the buck stops here. This is kind of a series I've been doing on first love. And uh, I started with the beginning of the year. And then I was gone a couple weeks, actually more than that. But, um, and so, but I want to continue with that theme because I want our lives to really be radically changed in 2020. I just have a tremendous excitement in my soul right now about this and the possibility of, of seeing tremendous change in people's lives, tremendous change. And um, I don't think God wants us to be satisfied. And so I want, in a way of an announcement, I have an announcement I want to make also that we're starting a, after we have two weeks left of the freedom class uh, that we're doing on Wednesday night. After that, we're going to be starting the last Wednesday of February, going till April 1st. We're going to be doing a class on vision, how to receive a vision from the Lord, and also how to, have, how to handle it in such a way to see it come to pass in our lives. It's one thing to have a vision, but it's very important how we handle vision how we handle vision. So we're going to be starting that. We're going to be studying that on Wednesday night. And I'm just expecting that, uh, that every single one of us, at the end of 2020, our lives will be radically different. Amen. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I heard this preacher, actually a very famous preacher, say this. He's the pastor of the world's largest church. It's over, I think they have over a million people. That's a lot of people in one church, a million people. It's in Seoul, Korea. I think he's semi-retired now, but um, he made this statement. Now, listen, listen to this statement. God will never bring about any of his works in your life without coming through your own personal faith. Let me read that one more time because it's, I think that's an incredible statement. God will never bring about any of his great works in your life without coming through your own personal faith. Amen. See, sometimes we wonder, why doesn't God do something? I mean, why doesn't he do this? Why doesn't he take care of this? And we kind of leave it up to God, but God goes, I work through your personal faith. And um, this verse in Mark chapter 11 says, let's read this, or I'll read it, you can listen. It says, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. Notice that he starts out here by saying, what things soever you desire. What things soever you desire. Look at how open-ended that statement is. What things soever you desire. What things soever you desire. There's really no conditions put on it other than this, that you're asking from God, and if God doesn't have it, you're not going to get it from him. I remember one time I heard this lady, she was, she was actually wanted another, another woman's husband. And she was using this verse to try to get it. Well, the problem is God doesn't have that. How many know that's true? He doesn't have that. But when you study scripture, especially looking at God's promises, you get a feel for what God wants to see happen in the earth. Amen? You get a feel for it because God doesn't say something or promise something that is contrary to what he wants. In other words, when I... When I talk to people, I tell people what I want or I express what I want, basically what my will is. So the will of God is actually discovered in Scripture. Amen? And so the first thing is, what's, what things soever you desire. Now, I, I'm, I, we're going to be talking about dreaming with God, dreaming with God. You know, there's a verse in Habakkuk. I looked up Habakkuk. You know, I actually need reading glasses to read. I never bring my reading glasses anywhere. And so then I, um, I try to find it, squint through. But anyways, Habakkuk chapter 2. I uh, should have somebody else read it. Why don't somebody else look it up? Here it is. I found it. It's a miracle. Habakkuk chapter 2. It's in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Habakkuk. Just kidding. It's toward the end of the Old Testament. It's on page 1,268. <laughs> but Habakkuk chapter 2, listen to this. Let, let me get my reading glass. Could you give me my reading glass? Oh, just give me yours. I'll use yours. <laughs> oh. I was at a restaurant, and I had my wife's reading glasses on looking at the menu, and they're all, you know, they're all purple, and they're all sparkly. You know, the woman's, the lady looks, the waitress looks at me and says, nice glasses. <laughs> 
I said, I'm accessing my feminine side. <laughs> but look at this, what Habakkuk said. He says, I will stand my watch. This is verse one. Will set myself on the ramparts and watch to see what he says to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. See what he said? This is how vision starts. This is how vision starts. Vision starts with spending, dreaming with God, spending time with God, saying, God, I, I'm, I'm going to dream with you today. I'm going to dream. I want you to dream with me. I want you to put your dreams and your, your envis vision into my heart. I want, I, want, I want to dream with you today. And what happens is God begins to put his dreams in your heart. He starts putting dreams and visions in your heart. Amen. I remember one time I was praying. This is years ago, and our kids were all teenagers. Well, uh, maybe mid-range teenagers and younger. We had five kids, have five kids. And uh, I, was, I was praying and meditating one day, and all of a sudden, I had this picture inside of me. I wasn't trying to picture it. I wasn't saying, oh, let me see if I can picture this. It kind of took me by surprise. I was, all of a sudden, it flashed on my imagination. How many of that we all have an imagination? Right. It flashed in my imagination. I saw a little girl. I can still see it today. I saw a little girl with her hands raised, worshiping God with tears streaming down her face. And I said, what is that? And the Lord spoke to me and said, that's your great granddaughter. I said, what? I'm capturing generations. I'm not just capturing your life or your wife's life or even your kid's life. I'm capturing generations. And my kids, you know, at that time, they're kind of, you know, they, they, I wish they would always, they would go in a straight line, but they, they didn't go in a straight line. They kind of wiggle back and forth. How many can relate to that statement? You know, but I mean, basically they've served God and, and been spirit filled and, and served God, but sometimes they wiggle a little bit. But I always kept that in my imagination that I'm not living or believing just for my own life or just my, even my children's life, but I'm, I'm going after generations of, of cornamones. I want, so that means my grandkids, I see them worshiping God, but my great grandkids, I'm, I'm affecting them with my life and I don't even realize it and you don't even realize it. But God gave me that vision he gave me that dream when I, he said, I'm going to give you a dream about your generation, Steve. Let's watch, watch this. And he gave me that picture. And I still see it today. Sometimes when I'm worshiping, I, I see that little girl. She has brown hair. I see her. I see her. I see her with her hands raised, tears streaming down her face, worshiping God. And see, what happens is when God gives you a vision or a dream like that, you have to hold on to it. You have to treat it a certain way. If you don't treat it a certain way, you can actually lose it. It's not automatic. It's not automatic. You say, well, God wants to do that. God wants, there's, if you read through scripture, God wants to do a lot of things that people, because they didn't cooperate, God couldn't do. I mean, the children of Israel, if you read, Roman, or you read Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, it's very clear. The children of Israel, God said to that first generation, not I'm going to give you the land. He said, I've already given you the land. That means if God says, I've given you the land, everything that you need to possess that land is inside of you. I don't know why you're so quiet. I'm pretty excited about this message. That means everything that's inside, that means inside that first generation, that means they were all giant killers. Because there were giants in the land, if they were going to possess the land, that means they had to be, they had to be giant killers. They had to be walled city terror downers. <laughs> right? They had to be all those things. But when they got to the promised land and they heard about the giants and they heard about the walled cities, they go, we grasshoppers. No, you're not. If God said, I gave you the land, you're not a grasshopper. You're a giant killer. Right? right. I mean, you're perfect. You're per how do you say this? Perfectly fit to do some bad, uh, to, to bring about some bad stuff to the, the, to the Canaanites that were living in that land. You're perfect because God made you that way. But they didn't see themselves that way. And so because they didn't live with God's vision, they created their own vision. They say, we can't. 
and they didn't, they, that whole generation didn't go in. And it says that it made God so mad. Now listen to this, it made God so mad. It said he swore in his wrath that they wouldn't enter. In fact, he told Moses, step aside. I'm wiping them out. I've had it with these people. And Moses said, don't do it. <laughs> Amen. But that whole generation died in the wilderness. That was not God's will. That wasn't God's plan. God's plan was that for them to possess the land. How many can see what I'm saying? And so what they do is they turn loose of something that was clearly God's will. In fact, if you read Hebrews 3 and chapter 4, what you'll find is that God was saying, uh, he said uh, he was angry with them. He says they go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. And he said they have an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. And he said the works were finished from the foundation of the world. That means God planned before the foundation of the world that they would possess that land. And they, they chose not to. And so that's what you see. You see a clear picture of this is what God wants and people failing to lay hold of it. You know, last week when I was, we, we were, came to the end of the message, I had this picture in my mind of, of somebody like feeling a tremendous amount of regret about where their life had ended up. In other words, saying, I didn't plan my life to end up here. And I know there's something different that God had for me, and it wasn't this. Do you know that, listen, God never changes his mind. You can just, you, if you've been astray from God's vision for your life or God's purpose for your life, you can rehook up. You can rehook up today. You can, you can decide today. You gave me that dream. You gave me that vision. You gave me that perspective. I'm going to believe it. And from this day forward, I'm going to handle it right because it's precious. I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever seen this commercial. Sometimes commercials ruin your perspective sometimes. It was a TV commercial where this says, uh, Pinocchio would be a bad uh, motivational speaker. How many of you ever seen that one? <laughs> Look around. <laughs> it's, a, it's actually kind of funny, you know. <laughs> you go, I see people with, you know, I don't remember exactly the words, but he's trying to build them up. And the, his nose keeps growing, you know. <laughs> but, but listen, there's more potential inside of every single one of us than we're living. Amen. And all it takes is to have, is to hear a word from God is to get God's perspective on things. So it says here in Mark 11, going back to this, it says, what things soever you desire. So he kind of opens it up, and it's so powerful to sit with God and say, Lord, here are the things I desire, and give me a, give me a vision or give me a word for it. Give me a word. Get, let me see it clearly. Let me understand it clearly. Let me see it clearly. And all of a sudden, you can start to see things clearly. God will give you a, a, a picture in your imagination. He'll give you a word. And that word is his intention. He wants to see this thing come to pass in your life. See, God's a good God. I know that's a huge revelation to a lot of people, but God's good. And God's actually for you. He's on your side. Amen? And so he said, what things were you eyes? So here, look at what he says. The next thing he says in Habakkuk here, he says, I'm going to stand on my ramparts. I'm going to watch. I want to hear what God was going to say to me. And then he says this. Then the Lord instructed me and said, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets that he who runs, uh, he who may run who reads it, that he may run who reads it. Boy, we're doing good this morning, Steve. For the vision is yet for a appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. See, what he's saying here is that uh, in, in, in this case, he's saying that you have to make it plain. See, the Bible says what things soever you desire, it's specific things. Have you ever noticed this at times people would come to Jesus and they, they first of all, they try to flag him down, you know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then he'd stop. And this one case was a blind man. And the blind man comes, he calls the blind man. And here's what Jesus says. Now, this should be obvious. He said, he looks at, Jesus looks at the blind man and says, what do you want for me to do to you, for you? Wouldn't that be an awesome thing to hear? You come to Jesus and Jesus says, what is, what is it that you want me to do for you? What is it that you want me to do for you? He goes, he made him say it. I want to receive my sight. 
He goes, go your way as you have believed, so be it done unto you. See, that's a picture. What, see, it's almost like a prophetic question this morning. What is it that you want God to do for you? Amen. What is it? Someone goes, well, he would never say that. He said it in the Bible. He doesn't change. I believe he would say it to you. What is it that you want him to do for you? But he will give you a word, or he'll, that's where it starts. Because faith always starts with a vision or a word or a picture. See, actually, vision gives, gives birth to faith because vision is actually a part of your hope. It doesn't start with faith. It starts with hope. In other words, you go... I want all my kids, using that theme, I want all my kids to serve God. I want every one of them to be serving God. I mean, that's a good thing. I want not only my kids, I want my grandkids. I want every single one of them to serve God. I want them to be on fire. I want the, I want the fire of their devotion just to be unbelievable. That's where it starts. God could give you that word or that picture. And you could see that in your imagination. You go, I see it. I can see it. You see, some people mock that. They go, oh, God's just going to do what he wants to do anyways. Really? He works through your own personal faith. And I was reading one time through the book of Hebrews, and I came to chapter, uh, chapter 6, where it says, um, it talks about Abraham. I like Abraham. Because he's an example that the Bible uses of us, of the father of our faith, or an example of faith. It says that we should follow the steps of our father Abraham. And so here's what it says about Abraham. It says that when God made promise to Abraham, now listen to this, when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, God swore by himself saying, blessed, surely blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. And so I thought to myself, God's over there going, I it's like, you know, we say sometimes the expression, we don't, probably don't say it anymore, but we say, I swear to God. Right? Have you heard the expression, I swear to God? I, do they say that anymore? I don't say it, but I mean, does anybody ever say it? I swear to God. But in God's case, he, he said, I swear by myself. I swear by myself. Because he could swear by no greater. If there was somebody greater, he said, I'd swear by somebody greater. But there's nobody greater. So he goes, I swear by myself that surely blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. So I used to look at that going, why did God, why does God keep going to Abraham going, I'm going to do this. I promise. I swear to you I'm going to do it. I, he, he keep going on and on about, I promise you I'm going to do this. I swear to you I'm going to do this. And then he gave him pictures. So he, he put mental pictures. He said, you see the stars, Abraham? Bring them out at night. See the stars? That's what your descendants are going to look like. Then during the day, he said, you see the sand? That's what your descendants are going to look like. So every, it, it, I mean, 24 hours a day, he's got a picture of his descendants. He, he saw it in the daytime. He saw it at night constantly. And I'm going to myself, why did God go through all this with Abraham? Why didn't he just say, I'm going to do this, hide and watch? Why was it so important for Abraham to become fully persuaded that what God said he would do, that he was going to do. Why would, did Abraham have to be on board with it? Why, why, why? Because God does nothing in our lives through coming, without coming through our own personal faith. He wanted, he, Abraham had to become fully persuaded. You have to become fully persuaded. You have to become fully persuaded that what God said he would do, he's going to do. Yeah. See, because the next part of this verse in Hebrews 11 or Mark 11, it says, what things soever you desire, it's open-ended. It's, it's, that's why I always say, if it's not illegal, it's not immoral, or if it's not dishonest, if it falls into one of those categories, forget about it. God's not going to be involved. But if it's not one of those things, then it's open-ended. If it's consistent with Scripture, see, things, there are things that are consistent with Scripture. God did that for one person. If he did it for one person, he'll probably do it for you. Because he's no, expect, he's no uh, uh, how do you say that? He's no respecter of persons. He's no respecter of persons. But everybody has to come the same way. 
They have to have a vision for it. They have to have a, a, a dream. It has to be a dream. It has to have a vision for it. The way ahead, you say, what, what is the way ahead? Well, tell me what is your dreams and visions. And I'll tell you about the way ahead. Right? So he says here, what things soever you desire, it's open-ended. What things soever you desire. Then he says, when you pray, when you pray, believe that you receive them. This is a big point right here, believe that you receive them. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, believe that you're going to receive them. But believe that you have received them. When, you, when, when are you supposed to believe that you have received them? When you pray. There is a way that the Holy Spirit somehow inspires you where you actually feel like you're living with that thing that you're, you're dreaming about, that you're believing for. You're living with that thing even before you see it. You're living with that thing even before you see it. Amen? I mean, it's, it's, some, it's crazy. You, someone goes, what? What? But you can, you can actually get over, you step over a line where you can actually believe that you're living with that thing even though you don't see it. You live, you're living with that reality even though it doesn't appear yet. He said, if you get to that point where I'm living with it, where someone goes, oh, I see your kids aren't doing very good. I'll tell you every one of them serving God. <laughs> They're all Holy Ghost God, all the Holy Ghost kids. And their grandkids are Holy Ghost kids too. And their great -grand my great grandkids are Holy Ghost kids. Every single one of them. Whoa, excuse me. <laughs> but what you're doing is you're living, you're living in the present with the reality of what God said. You've already, you've already attained it in your own heart. You already attained it. And from that point on, all you're doing is thanking God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You say, you're crazy. Really? It's in the Bible. It's what Abraham did. And he's the father of our faith. And so I titled this message, that's my introduction. <laughs> it's a long one, isn't it? But I titled this message. So here, here's the thing, is that you go, well, because a lot of people, you know, they have this attitude. You know, when I first came, and I'm not trying to be critical, please. I, I listened to, you know, um, I uh, drove one of my dad's car ba cars back from Florida, and I opened the cubby hole. He had all a bunch of my old sermons. So he would listen to my old sermons. So I, I thought, well, I'll listen to some of them. Some of them were so good. I mean, I had to almost stop the car and, <laughs> and, and run around. I'm not kidding you. I, I, it was like, whoa, who is this preacher? Whoa. I got so excited. I'd be driving down the road crying. <laughs> that was awesome. But some of them, some of them were horrible. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what was, I must have been having a bad day. I call them the soapbox sermons. And I'm up there ranting about something. I'm going, oh, God, please. <laughs> I, I wanted to say, tell them to stop. Shut up. <laughs> it was brutal, man. I go, I got to keep listening. Oh, it's horrible. I was clearly upset about something. <laughs> I don't know why I told you this. That. I actually don't remember why I told you this. But, but here's, here's my point, is that sometimes people, you know, they kind of have a passive attitude that, that they want their life to be different than it is right now. And it doesn't matter how old you are. Some people say, well, I'm old now, and I don't need anything. I don't want it. Hey, 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 hey. If you're still sucking air, <laughs> you need to get a, we need you. Get a vision about our political situation. Get a vision about our state. Get a vision about our nation. Get a vision about souls being one for the kingdom. Get a vision about the kingdom of God coming into the earth. Get a vision and start praying along that line. Get a vision about schools coming to know Jesus in a powerful way. Get a vision, no matter how old you are, you're gonna have a vision to touch humanity. Right? But sometimes we have this passive attitude. You know, I used to call it the Doris Day approach to Christianity. Remember Doris Day? Some of you older people, young people don't have any earthly idea who Doris is and who her day, what her day was. But, but uh, 
we, the, Doris, the Doris Day show started, how many remember what it started? The, the intro, what, what, what it was. Her riding a bike, going down the street, going what? K Sarah, Sarah, wherever we'll be, we'll be. The future's not ours to see. So what? K Sarah, Sarah. I hate that song. <laughs> I hate that song. I remember I was talking to a lady one time about the Lord, and she wanted me to know that she was spiritual. She wasn't a Christian. She was into kind of like Mideastern stuff. I'm not trying to be critical. And, um, and she said this. She says, if it's meant to be, how many know the next phrase? It will be. It will be. If it's meant to be, it will be. Do you know there's a lot of things that were meant to be that ain't be? You say, that can't be right. That is right. The children of Israel were meant to be in that promised land. They, they didn't end up there, the first generation. God's will is not automatic. So that's my first part. You still got that up there. The buck stops here. The first part, uh, there's two, two buck stops here. The first one is, it's the buck stops with you. God's standing there going, I'm ready. I'm ready. You, you say, God, I, I want my, the trajectory of my life to go in a different direction. God says, I'm ready. Here's what I, here's what I say. He, he, God's going, you go, God, I want 2020 to be a different year than 2019. I want, I want there to be a different outcome. I want to end up in a different place. At the end of 2020, I want to end up in a different place. Amen. God goes, God looks at you and goes, I'm ready. I'm ready. But it starts with you. It starts with you. The buck stops with you. Amen? Amen. The second thing I want to I want to see about this, and I gotta I ha, I really actually have five minutes. I should just quit right there. Should I just quit? No. You wanna hear just the, some of you see the front row, they always yell, go, go. The back row goes, shut up up there. <laughs> we'll get some food in the back. I'm hungry. I want to get out of here. All right. It's fun. It's absolutely fun to be in church this morning. <laughs> and I'm having the time of my life right now. It's just awesome. I can't wait till the end of 2020. Oh, man, I got me some, I was writing down some things. I'm, I got me some stuff going on inside. Woo! I get excited just thinking about it. <laughs> because I know God's waiting for I, He goes, I've been waiting on you, son. What are you doing? Well, I've been kind of digging holes in the basement. I don't know. <laughs> well, stop digging holes in the basement. Get up here. Let's get some stuff done. Yeah. World's ready to experience a great revival. I want you to be a part of it. Okay. <laughs> you want to hear my second part of the buck stops here? Yeah. Well, actually, the second part of this sermon, you might not be so excited when I tell you what it is. The second part of this sermon has to deal with prosperity and money. Because some people think that God's not interested in that. But he is. And some people think that God's trying to get, take all their money away or whatever. But here's, here's the thing. Let me just end this with just giving you a little bit of a, a point on this. The buck stops here. The problem with the buck stops here, literally, the problem with prosperity or the problem with money is this. If, if you handle money like the buck stops here, what I mean by that is when the money comes, it stops with you. Oh, that's really a good point. If the, it literally, if the money comes and it stops with you and it gets tied up with you, completely tied up with you, that is a problem. That's a serious problem. Right. See, what God, I mean, God blesses our storehouse and he wants to bless our investment, but here's the deal, is that if we are just going to be the type of people that just hoard things, in other words, we're going to dig it out of one hole, put it in another hole, get all we can, what's the next one? Can all we get, and then sit on our can. 
that is not even close to what God has in mind. Not even close. But God wants us to be a, a channel. He wants, this, he wants to bless us so that we can be a blessing. If you're, not, if you're not blessed, it's hard to be a blessing. But God gives us increase so that we can be a blessing. Isn't that true? Yeah. Notice this last verse, and I'll close with this. I had, I had a bunch of verses here. But look at second, or 1 Timothy chapter 6, and this will be our last verse. In fact, the worship team could probably come. Verse, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Charge those who are rich in this present world that they be not haughty, nor have their hopes set on this uncertainty of riches, but on the living God, now look at this, on the living God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy, that they do good, that be rich in good works, that they be ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold of eternal life. You see, poverty, a poverty mentality, what it does is it causes us, there's a number of things that, that well, one thing it causes us to do, it causes us to be hoarders because we think that there's not enough. If, if, you're, if you're struggling financially, you might think, well, the reason I'm struggling financially is because those rich one percenters have all the money. That's not true. Do you know there's a, there's a website that you can go on? Don't go on it right now, but later you can go on it. And you can actually type in your salary, your year-to-day salary, and it tells you where you fall as far as the world's population, as far as income in the world's population. It tells you where you fall. Now, I don't remember the exact number, but it's in the 30s. If you make like, I think it's around 35000 a year, if you make that, you're a one percenter. If you make 35000 a year or more, you're a one percenter. Amen. As far as the world population goes, world's income goes, that means 99% of the world's populations makes less than you. If you make more than 35000 So if you ever go, them wicked one percenters, <laughs> you a one percenter. <laughs> as far as the world goes. Right? Well, I didn't want to be one of them. Well, I mean, if you're going to look at, at the world as a whole, in fact, if you put in your salary, you know, you're going to find out that you're probably, all Americans are going to find out they're way up there. Yes. Way up there. So what, I, what am I trying to say? He says, he didn't say, I want you to suggest to the rich. He said, command the rich, charge them. In this present world, he didn't say give all their money away or sell everything they have and give it to the poor. He didn't say that. He said, charge them that they be not haughty, nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. How many of the economies can tank? I mean, you can go from rags to or riches to not so many riches pretty fast. Because riches are uncertain. But he said, don't trust the uncertainty of riches, but put your trust in the living God. What does the living God do? He richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Amen. What does the living God do? He's, he's, talking to the, he's talking to people that are, are, are givers. He's talking to people where the buck doesn't stop with them. See, I think somebody should get a vision here of being a person that can live on 10% and give 90% away Amen. and still do pretty well. What about that? What about being the type of person that you have resources are coming where you get a vision for your future, resources are coming and you have, you have an abundance to give to every good work. Somebody goes, we need some money over here, I'll give to that. We need some money over here, I'll give to that. To be that type of person, I think that's part of God's plan. Thank you for your enthusiasm. He gives us richly all things to enjoy. Did you put that up there? 
that verse up there? Everything to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, that they are ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Amen. Praise God. Let's all stand together. So I did that whole sermon announcing this class on Wednesday night. Not two more weeks of freedom freedom class. So I think it's I think it's the 27th of February, the 27th of February. I want you to just turn right now to your neighbor and invite them to come to that class the 27th of February. Say so you're invited to that class. Go ahead tell your neighbor. You're invited to that class the 27th. 26. Okay, we I did it wrong. All right everybody, I did it wrong. I did it wrong. It's the 26th of February. So go to your neighbor again and re-invite them. 26th of February. So here's what we're going to talk about. Here's what we're going to talk about. How to get a vision. How to dream with God. How to dream with God. And then how to put that vision in front of you. And how to watch that vision come to pass. Amen. Amen. It's going to be awesome. Amen. Yeah, so that's, when, it, when is it again? Uh, 26. 26. Uh, in the back there, what day is it? Oh, that's really good. It's the 26th, not the 27th. Somebody say the 27th. It's the 26th. What day is it back there? 26. Back there in the back. What day is it? 26. Okay, thank you. Okay, I only had one person in the back say 26. What day is it? Okay, 26th, Wednesday, the 26th. It's going to be awesome. Amen. Let's just close our eyes for a moment. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for vision, God. Thank you, Lord, for vision. Thank you for fresh vision, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for vision. Thank you, Lord, for fresh vision. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for dreaming with you, that we get to dream with you, Lord. Hallelujah, that you give, you said in your word that when the Holy Spirit is poured out, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, one of the things that he does is he gives dreams and visions. Dreams and visions. Holy Spirit of God, I open myself up to receive your dreams and visions. Hallelujah, about my future, about my life. I open myself up, Holy Spirit, to receive dreams and visions for 2020. What you want to do in my life, what you want to do in the life of this church, what you want to do, Lord. I open myself up to receive. Can you just pray that prayer while you're standing there? Just say that, Holy Spirit, I open myself up to receive your dreams and visions. Can you just say that? Just go ahead and say that. Holy Spirit, I open myself up. I open myself up to receive your dreams and visions. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that it starts with a dream and a vision. Hallelujah. That's the starting point. Hallelujah. Vision gives birth to faith. Visions and dreams gives birth to faith. Hallelujah. Faith gives substance to what we dream about, but it starts with dreams and vision. Hallelujah. Faith gives substance to it, but the vision has to be there first. The dream has to be there first for faith to give substance to it. Hallelujah. Faith comes along and gives substance to it. Hallelujah. Once faith comes and gives substance to it, we lay hold of it. We believe that we receive it. And look out. It says we will have it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, let us not struggle in ourselves, but let us be open. Let us be a vessel, Lord, to receive your vision and dreams, Lord. Hallelujah. That which you want to do. Show every single one of us that which you want to do. And as you said in your word, write the vision. Lord, we'll be diligent to write it. Write it down. We'll, we'll, we'll write it down. We'll declare. We'll see it what you want to do. Hallelujah. Let's sing this song, then we'll close.
Praise God. God's good. Let's give God a hand clap, would you? Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being good. Praise God. Praise God. I'm going to invite, I'm going to invite the uh, prayer counselors to come forward at this time. And I just want to give you the opportunity before we go, before you go, I should say, if you need prayer for anything, to please come forward. As soon as I dismiss, one of these prayer counselors would be glad to pray for you. If you have a spiritual need, a physical need, a emotional, mental, even a financial need, they could agree with you in prayer. So we want you just to be prayed for, not to leave here without being prayed for. And also we have some refreshments in the back and the thing that you've been waiting for. No, maybe you haven't. But anyways, we want you to join us for some fellowship. God bless you all. You're free to go. You're a blessing.